Sam uh, and Tim for hosting us here. It's great to have a meetup at Yahoo and to have this really great space um, and to be able to give this talk. Uh, so this was, you know, our intent uh, here was to do a meetup for uh, a Spark development, which is for people interested in like at least understanding how Spark works, maybe contributing something to it. And honestly, we expected the first time that maybe about 30 people would sign up and we expected to have a small room somewhere. So we were really surprised by the number of people that signed up. We hope that it's, uh, it's actually useful to people. But uh, you know, for us, we're, we're growing a community of um, developers around the platform, even inside the lab at UC Berkeley, the number of people working on Spark and related uh, projects has grown quite a bit. And so we want to document um, all this stuff and um, make it easy for people to contribute and like, make it easy for them to get started and to understand what's going on inside Spark. So that's my goal here today. This is kind of the first talk I think that anyone has really given on, on Spark um, internals. And so it will just be kind of an introduction to what happens in there. But I hope it's useful to people who want to like, really understand uh, what it's doing, either because they want to deploy it or because they actually want to contribute something to it. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so, so that's what this is going to be. So I have, I think, about uh, 35 slides of stuff that I can show you, but I also hope to have a discussion. So if there's anything you have questions about, you should ask me, and also we'll have some time um, afterwards to do that, uh, to talk about uh, what's, uh, you know, just any questions you guys might have. So here's what I'm going to talk uh, about today. I'm going to start with just what are the goals we are trying to meet with Spark, and like you know, these are things that translate into the design. Uh, what are the key components in the system? And then I'll spend most of the time talking about the life of a job inside Spark and the different components it goes to, and like different things that can happen to it at that point, which actually lets you understand a lot about it, including how to extend it by adding new operations and things like that. Um, then I'll talk a little about ways you can extend Spark now, also ways that are not very hard to do in the future, but that aren't actually pluggable now. And finally, I just have a couple of slides on how to contribute to it. And you know, as I said, this assumes that you, you kind of know what, what Spark is, but we're just, we're just going to talk about how it works. So let me start with the goals. So for the project, we had um, four goals, or at least we have four goals now. Initially, you know, we, have, we had a subset of these. Um, so, but, but here's what they were. We had generality, low latency, uh, fault tolerance, and simplicity. So let me just explain those goals in turn. So for generality, we wanted a platform that can support a very wide um, array of workloads. So not just kind of your batch jobs that you do uh, with, with MapReduce, but also say iterative um, operations like machine learning, graph algorithms, and also different scales of workloads from sort of sub-second interactive jobs to jobs that run for many hours. Um, the, the other kind of thing we have in terms of generality is, is operators. So we wanted something that does more than just map and reduce. We wanted to let you um, combine a wide array of operators and you know, be able to group them together <coughs> to do a computation. That's another thing that will come up. Uh, the low latency just meant that for the small jobs and the small job sizes, we wanted to be able to get sub-second latency. And if you don't design that into the system from the beginning, it's hard to add it later on because you have all these components that assume it's okay to wait you know, for five seconds somewhere or harder to do something. So that's, you know, that's just something we got because we were aiming for these from the beginning. For fault tolerance, like a lot of cluster projects, you want faults to uh, not be viewed as a special case, to be something that the system can handle and recover from uh, by default uh, without particularly weird logic to deal with it. And I'll talk about that later too. And finally, for us, especially starting as a, just a purely academic project with a really small team, it was important uh, to have simplicity. Uh, so to have the design be simple. And I think we've, we've gotten quite far with actually really small code base. And that's one of the things I'm happy about. Um, and I think one of the lessons that we had here is that often you can get simplicity by making something slightly more general. Um, so it, for example, all the operators and stuff I'll talk about, even though you know, if at first you say I'm going to extend map readers with like 20 other operators, it sounds complicated. Actually, it leads to a nice factoring between the different levels of the scheduler that, that makes it possible to do this. So just talking about that, this is uh, the, the code base size of Spark. And uh, you know, one of the points here is just that 
it's something that's approachable, and like we want people to approach it. So Spark today is about 20,000 lines of code. If you compare it with Hadoop map readers, of course, it's, it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison because Hadoop has some features we don't have, like security, and you know we have some features they don't have, and we are written in Scala, and they're written in Java. But still, if you compare it, the Hadoop 1.0 is about 90,000 lines, and Hadoop 2.0, um, just the map reduce and yarn part, is uh, about 200,000. So certainly, we have something that is smaller here. And this is true also if you look at specific components. So I looked at, uh, before starting Spark, I actually worked uh, quite quite a bit on the Hadoop job scheduler. And so I looked at the first, the three biggest classes in that. Uh, and those three classes are 10,000 lines of code, whereas our scheduler is about uh, 2,500 lines. So certainly, you know, having that experience working with that helped us come up with something smaller. Of course, the scope is also something smaller. Um, if you look at the components of the code base, Here's kind of how it uh, breaks down. Um, so I've put the Spark core itself, which is the things that kind of always are involved no matter how you're running. Um, and then I put uh, some of the stuff that's built around it, but it's non nonetheless essential. Um, so underneath that, uh, we have uh, actually, you can plug in your own input sources in Spark, but the main way people use it is to use Hadoop, uh, Hadoop's input format interface, which you can plug in through this Hadoop I.O. wrapper, and that's about 400 lines of code. Um, we have different, uh, again, pluggable ways for a back end of the cluster that you're going to be scheduled on, but the two most common ones are Mesos and then the standalone deploy mode that we ship with Spark. And those are each, you know, they're actually fairly small things. The standalone deploy mode um, is bigger because we actually had to write like a little mini cluster manager. Um, we have the interpreter. The interpreter is actually basically the Scala interpreter where we changed a couple hundred lines. So even though it's 3,000 lines, most of those are code that the Scala team wrote, and we added a couple hundred. And then in Spark itself, we have a few uh, different elements there, but I think some of the things I want to point out are that actually like the operators, all the map, join, group by, all that stuff, is about 2,000 lines, and the scheduler is also uh, around 2,000 lines today. So these are things where, you know, people can go and look at it, you know, and in a day kind of figure out what's going on, and people have done that. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's, not, it's certainly going to, to go in the future and stuff, but, uh, but part of my point here is just to say that it is an approachable thing. Okay. So that's, that's kind of what the components are then. So networking yeah. includes serialization? Uh, yeah, so, so I should say that with, with networking, um, we often plug in external serialization libraries. Like we basically can use any Hadoop serialization library. That's part of the 400 lines. Actually, networking here is basically our shuffle and our um, like replication of data. You can cache data and have it replicated across nodes. So we wrote this networking library that's, uh, that, does, that uses like Java and I.O. to do that. Yeah. And then block manager is our key value store, essentially. Very simple key value store that acts as a cache. Yeah, and then actually broadcast is an interesting one. Broadcast is basically has a lot of research code in there. We wrote these different ways to do broadcast quickly on a cluster. So there's like a BitTorrent implementation and stuff. Most of that doesn't actually run unless you ask for it. By you know, by default it doesn't run. But that's that's actually where there's a lot of code because we tried to implement many different things. Okay. So yeah, that this this is kind of an overview. So let's look more detail at what the components are and then actually like how a job makes its way through the system. Um, so this is kind of what the components look like at a high level. Um, so first of all, you have your user program on the left, which is probably very hard to read, but there actually is a, is a program there. Um, and basically in your program, you create this object called the Spark context, and then you create these distributed data sets called RDDs, and you apply different operations on them. Um, and uh, that, that's kind of how you write programs in Spark. So inside uh, there, the Spark context is the thing that acts as a client for Spark, and it also acts as the master for your application. So in Spark, we have one master per job, essentially, per application. So that thing connects to the cluster and schedules things, and if it crashes, only your job is lost. You don't kill other people's jobs. But that was kind of the design. We wanted to run on top of something like Mesos or Hadoop Yarn, from the beginning. We didn't want to have a single uh, master that knows about um, every application. Um, so in, in there we have, you know, there's kind of these four 
pieces. We have the graph of the data sets you built. I'll talk more about that in a bit. We have the scheduler. Uh, the block tracker figures out what is in memory on each machine or what is on disk. And then the shuffle tracker coordinates shuffle operations that group by. Um, then the scheduler talks through a cluster manager to the worker. And the worker is this really simple thing. All it does is it receives tasks that it runs inside a thread pool, and then it has this, uh, this key value, so the block manager on it, and it can serve blocks to other nodes. And then the tasks themselves can talk to HDFS and stuff like that. So these are kind of the pieces. And of course, there, there will be multiple workers, and the workers can talk to each other through the block manager to fetch blocks from each other. So that's that. So, so let's look at um, what, what an example job looks like. And let, let's look in, at a very high level at like, what actually happens when you run this. And then I'll do a more detailed dive into it. So this is kind of what your typical job looks like. You first create a Spark context object. You tell it to connect to a cluster. Um, and then you create these distributed uh, data sets. So first, here we're going to make a text file, which is in the Hadoop file system. Um, and then we're going to apply a filter on it, pick out the lines that contain error. And then I'm also going to mark this one to be cached. And, I'm also, and then I'm going to do count, which is an action, which basically gives me back a result at the end. So these data sets in between, the file and errors, are what we call resilient uh, distributed data sets, or RDDs. And the resilient is because we can automatically reconstruct them on failure. So these are the objects you work with. Um, and then essentially you build these up through these uh, lazy uh, transformations like filter, and nothing actually gets computed until you run something called an action, which is this thing at the end. So action is a method that instead of returning an RDD, it returns like an integer or something. So you have to go out and actually compute something. And at this point, when you call count, the system is going to look at all the transformations you did and say, OK, how am I going to turn these into a bunch of tasks and actually run them? So here's in more detail what the RDDs look like. So basically, each time you call filter and group by and you know, all these operations, you're building this graph of objects that depend on each other. Here, we just had file and errors. And each of these objects is a subclass of RDD. And so we have Hadoop RDD, which is a thing that knows its path in HDFS, and filtered RDD, which is a thing that remembers the filter function you gave it, um, and also knows its parent, so it has this pointer to the parent. I just I showed the arrow the other way because it's less confusing that way. Um, and finally, each RDD remembers whether it should be stored in memory or otherwise cached. So in here, I just said, OK, we should cache it. But that's, these objects just build up this graph. Now, even though the Java objects in the program build up a graph at the data set level this way, when we run stuff, we run stuff in terms of partitions. So each, um, each data set is <laughs> composed of multiple partitions. Think of these like the blocks in your file. And each partition uh, can be sitting on a different machine. You know, some partitions might actually be on two machines if, we, you know, if it's a replicated data set or something like that. And then the system inside knows the dependencies at the level of partitions. So it knows here for filter, for example, say these four things are the blocks of the HDFS file. And I need to, you know, for each one, I did a filter to get the corresponding partition in the output. OK? So that's how that works. And finally, given this graph of like partitions that depend on each other, the system has to decide to launch some tasks. And it's not just going to launch a task to do each of these things and have the tasks you know, kind of exchange the data in between. The system actually tries to pipeline together as many operations as it can. So in this case, it says, OK, you, you have this file you need to read from Hadoop. Then you need to do a filter. And at the end, you're doing a count. So I'm going to launch one task that's going to read block one, and then filter block one, and then return the count to the master. Um, I'm going to launch another task that's going to do the same for block two. And similarly, I have one task for block three and one task for block four. So the point here is just that um, it's going to look at this graph and group together things when it can along a line going down. So for example, if you did like uh, a map after the filter, you would still have four tasks. But each task would be doing the filtering and then the mapping in, a, in kind of a pipeline uh, fashion. So hopefully <coughs> that makes sense. So again, let me know if, if there are questions about it. Um, and then the final thing that, again, I'll get to it more later, is when it does this scheduling, uh, Spark also knows about data locality and about data that's already cached. 
And the data locality is strictly a hint in Spark. So it's designed so that um, in any task can run on any machine. Uh, and that's kind of nice when you're dealing with faults and stuff. You don't have to worry about like, oh, which machine am I going to put it on now? But when possible, it tries to um, assign things based on locality. So here, the first time you run this program, it would say, well, I haven't actually cached the, the file yet, so let me look at the locality preferences of HDFS and launch the task based on that. The second time you run it, it's actually going to look at this graph and say, okay, these, these partitions are sitting in the cache somewhere, so I'm just going to reuse those. And it's going to use the locations returned by those. And because we remember this whole graph of operations, if anything falls out of the cache, this is just an optimization. We can always go back to reading it uh, from HDFS at the beginning. So that's, that's kind of an overview of what happens. So now I'm going to go into, into uh, quite a bit more detail about this and just show you, uh, in general, the life that a job goes through in Spark. And I think if you, uh, if you see this, it, it's easy to pick up and understand what all the other components are doing. They're all actually like fairly minor things that plug into this process somewhere around me. So that's, that's what I'm going to go into next. But it will just be a more detailed version of what I showed before. Okay. So um, basically, the life of a job has kind of these four stages that I'm going to show here. And the first stage is that in your code, you're sitting there in your you know, Scala program or Java or whatever, and you're building up this graph of operators and data sets. So in this one, for example, we have, you know, we had two data sets, maybe two files. We did a join, we did a group by, and then we did a filter. And we got this graph of RDD objects at the top, similar to like the data set graph I showed before. Now, this, this graph is just sitting there, as you call the operations. When you run an action on it, like count, um, it gets submitted to what's called the DAG scheduler. So the DAG scheduler is like the top half of the scheduler in Spark. And it actually, there's this nice separation between it and a lower level scheduler. So the DAG scheduler builds up this graph at the partition level that I showed earlier, where it knows the dependencies at the partition level. And it has kind of two holes. One is to look at this graph and to do the pipelining I talked about and to turn the partitions into tasks. And the second role is, um, so basically these tasks will be grouped into stages. Um, and between the stages, there will be some barriers. Like, um, for example, <coughs> Here, we, this is going to be kind of the map side of a shuffle. So um, we have to first do the map task before we can do the reduce tasks. And so basically, this guy is going to divide the graph into these stages. And then it's going to submit each stage to run on the cluster um, as previous parent stages finish. Yeah? That parallelism of three in the second stage onwards, is it inferred or does it, is it actually part of the original DAG and you're just not showing you? No, it's part of the DAG. So you tell it, when you do group by or whatever, you have to tell it the level of parallelism, yeah. And we can't really change it at runtime now. Um, it, would be kind, it would be interesting to do that, but I know you can't, yeah. Okay, so this is, this is what it sees at this level. So, the next level is something called the task scheduler. So the, at, at the top level here, we, we split the graph into these stages. And inside each stage, we have these independent tasks. We just have like you know four blocks we have to read from HDFS, or like four reduced tasks we need to run. The job of the task scheduler is given one of these sets of tasks, which is called, appropriately enough, a task set, um, actually run it on the cluster. So it has a simpler role. It doesn't care about what the stage depends on before or what comes after. Its job is just get these tasks done. And then tell the DAG scheduler when you finish, and it can submit the next stage. So basically, yeah. So just terminology, stage is a single partition in a single stage of RDD, or is it a Yeah. No, a, a stage is a set of tasks. So, a, so yeah, actually, I should have showed that here. So here there are actually three stages. So one of them is going to be this, to do these two math tasks. One of them is going to be to do these two. And then one of them is going to do this and this together, because these can be pipelined together. But basically, the, the thing that the boundary of a stage is usually wherever there's a shuffle, because we need to finish all kind of the math tasks before we start to reduce tasks. Yeah. It's kind of like the map and reduce stages in math. So when you say submit each stage as ready, you meant submit each? 
pipeline set of tasks. Yes. As their input becomes. Ready. Yeah, as their parents say. Yeah. So like here, for example, here we would submit this and this at the same time because they don't depend on anything. And then when they both finish, we would submit this set of three tasks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And also, as you see here, the dependency of the task is only on its inputs. Where does it actually write it? Does it know anything about that? Oh yeah, it, it, it does. Um, yeah, essentially there are two things a task can do. Like one of them is um, it's the final output of the job and then it's going to either like you, you tell it to save to HDFS or something, it's gonna do that or you turn it back to the master like in the case of count or it's, a, um, it's kind of the map side of a shuffle. So in that case, it's going to write it to like local um, blocks in memory or on disk in, in the block store I talked about, and later other nodes are going to fetch it from that machine. Yeah. Yeah. What if the input to the, uh, the first join those four tasks, uh, the first all part and not in one task set, why are they two? Oh, why are these not in one task set? Because they happen to come from two different parents. That's just the way it works. But but these two task sets can actually be submitted at the same time. So they'll run at the same time. Yeah. They're just from two data sets that you joined. OK. So that's how this works. So then the cluster manager, its job is you just get a bag of tasks, you know, try to run them. The other thing it does is uh, it, it handles like retrying each task a fixed number of times. So um, because. So, so for example, if one of the nodes fails, or if a node is going slowly, we might try running the task on a different one. The thing it can't handle, though, is if you lose the output of a previous stage in, in the shuffle, because then you're going to launch the task, and it tries to talk to that node, and it fails. So that's like the one case when you go back to the DAG scheduler, and you tell it, OK, this previous stage has now failed. You know, Can you resubmit it? Uh, but mostly, this is where fault handling happens. Um, and finally, um, the task scheduler ends up sending actual tasks to the workers. And the worker, as I was saying before, is this really simple thing. It has a bunch of threads to run them. And then it has this block manager. Uh, and it, it talks to the master. And it, it can serve blocks to other nodes. And the worker knows nothing about the task. It doesn't even know about the state. It just gets this piece of code. And it, it's told, OK, run this. And like tell me if anything goes wrong. Or tell me what result it gave at the end. OK. So there are a few things about. Uh, about this um, that, that are interesting that, that I want to point out. So one of them is the DAX scheduler actually doesn't know anything about all the operators in Spark. It doesn't know like what a map is and what a group by is or what a join is. Uh, it's designed so that those operators can be written outside without modifying the scheduler. And I'll explain how that works. But that's, it's a nice thing because it makes it really easy to add new operators and to like, understand the two pieces of code without you know, having to change um, stuff each, each time you add a new operator. And this one, uh, the, the, the task um, scheduler doesn't know about the dependencies between stages. So all it does is you give it a bunch of tasks, it runs them. Um, and the only, thing, the only way it kind of knows about stages is if a task fails because it couldn't fetch output from a previous stage, that's a special kind of error where it tells the, uh, the DAG scheduler that that failed. But what's nice about this is like if you were writing your own, say, backend to, to run uh, you know, Spark tasks on EC2 or whatever, run them on a GPU, some crazy runtime that we never envisioned, you don't need to know about the stuff at the mm -hmm. higher levels. You just need to deal with this, you know, here's a task set, give me back the results business. So it makes it easy to plug that in. Yeah? Can you, can you cancel a job? Can you cancel a job? You can't cancel it right now. Uh, it would be, yeah, it would be nice to add that, but not today you can't, yeah. So you talk about task scheduler talks about tasks, but DAX scheduler submits stages. How do you manage it? Yeah, a stage is just a set of tasks, basically. So, um, but the cluster manager doesn't need to know, the task scheduler doesn't need to know about the interrelationship of tasks? Yeah, this, this one doesn't, because you'll only get each stage when its parents are ready. Um, so, like, the tasks in each stage are independent of each other. Yeah, yeah. so if, for example, the DAX scheduler submits uh, group by filter. Yeah to a task schedule. Yeah. It has told it how many partitions are expected to Yeah, yeah, it has. It, it made that decision. Right, it yeah. made that decision. Yeah. But the task scheduler needs to now know that it needs to run two tasks, one followed by the other, on a single machine. Oh, yeah. But actually, oh, yeah, so I should be clear. So this stuff, 
the task object itself encapsulates that, so this guy doesn't know what's inside the task. We create a task object that does that calls both those functions. So basically, task schedule is is not going to look inside. Yeah, it doesn't look inside. The worker. Though. Yeah, yeah. The worker actually the worker just calls Han on it. So you know, you just get this object and you call Han. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, will one task that is producing uh, work for the next task be able to? Run no, it can. So that's the thing we don't have. Right now, we don't have like pushing output from one task into the downstream. Yeah, yeah, and that would complicate things in, in many ways. It, it's yeah, it's not impossible. But actually, we, we found we could get pretty far without it. So we'll see how, how that goes. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about errors and like how do you know when a task is straggling? I mean, maybe oh maybe yeah, one of the task is supposed to be slow. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Okay, so that's a really hard one. The, the, right now, we have a very simple heuristic to tell when it's straggling. Like we look at the other tasks in the stage, and we say if it's taken longer than the median by like a factor of I don't know one point five or something like that, then let's assume that it's slow. Yeah. So that's that's stuff that we can we can improve on. But I think part of the point is like that. Um, that can be changed. That can be changed without really modifying the other pieces. So. Um, you don't yeah. need to know. I mean, I guess if you're joining two RDDs, one might be a lot slower than the other. Yeah, yeah. No, you, it, you, I mean, yeah, you could imagine knowing about it, but right now we just assume that the tests in the same stage are meant to be similar to each other. So we do know, like, the difference between stages. We're not going to, you know, right. compute statistics from one stage and use them to decide about a very different kind of tests. And we hope that they're balanced enough inside. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll talk more. I'll also talk about how we recover from like failures uh, later on. Okay, okay, well, that's, that's good. So this is this is kind of the high-level picture um, of this. Um, okay. Oh yeah, and then I think this thing up here. So I, I was saying this doesn't know about stages. So sometimes it tells the DAG scheduler that a stage has failed. You know, I couldn't read data from it. Please run it again b before giving me downstream stages. That's like the one feedback that goes back. Okay, so so let me talk now about this first part of like how the DAG scheduler itself is agnostic to the operators, and this is like one of the parts that's nice if, if you want to plug in stuff, like if you want to plug in a new input source or whatever, uh, this is actually the way you would do it. Um, so basically, when we designed Spark, we wanted uh, to have to support a really wide array of operators, we thought it's, it's really annoying in MapReduce to have to like write everything from scratch in terms of map and reduce, figure out how to do joins and stuff. We just want to provide them out of the box. Um, and we want to let users compose them into a graph in any way they want. Um, at the same time, we didn't want to modify the scheduler for each one. So basically, we wanted to have this way to capture the dependencies between data sets generically uh, without having the scheduler know the details. So that's why. Um, we have the, this interface of, of RDD. And we have this interface that's based on five methods, essentially, that capture all the information we need to know uh, about dependencies. And all the Spark RDDs are actually written by subclassing this interface. So the, the, there are five methods. Uh, let me just go through them in turn uh, when you define a new type of RDD. So one of the things you have to do is uh, define a set of partitions. The partitions are called splits in the code for kind of historical reasons, but they'll actually be renamed to partitions eventually. But if you look in the code, it will say splits. And you just say, okay, here, here they are. Like, for example, I have one partition for HDFS block. You define a list of dependencies. I'll talk more about what a dependency object is on parent RDDs. Um, you define a function that computes a partition given its parents. So given like an iterator for each of the parents, you should produce an iterator for the output partition. That's, that's how the code looks. Um, and then there are two optional things you can provide. You can provide preferred locations, which are like locality preferences. If your data set is in HDFS, for example, you can uh, ask HDFS where it's located. And you can also say, I know that my data set will be hash partitioned or sorted or something like that. So there's an object called the partitioner that captures the data distribution at the output. And the scheduler can use this sometimes to optimize future operations on this data set. And I'll, I'll talk about that. So how, how do we actually use this interface? Um, so um, let's start with, with the simplest um, kind of RDD, which is just input from an external system like Hadoop. So if we wanted to use this interface to implement Hadoop RDD, here's how we do it. 
Um, so we'd say, okay, make a new subclass of RDD. The partitions method just returns one partition per block of the file, and maybe inside the partition object it remembers the block ID or something like that. The dependencies, it has no dependencies, and the compute function for a partition is open up that block and read it. So just talk to HDFS and do it. Um, and then the, the optional methods, and this one we want to have preferred locations because uh, to, to access each block, you know, we can ask HDFS which machines are their copies on, and we want to tell the scheduler to do that. So like, this is one of the things that the, the task scheduler and DAG scheduler look at when launching the task. So that, that's how the Hadoop RDD would work. Um, say we wanted to implement filter, for example. Um, the way we do that is we have this class filtered RDD, and it has um, a parent, and we just override the first three methods in there. So basically, the partitions for filter are going to be the same as the parent. We're just going to filter each one in place, like I showed with the little arrows before. The dependencies, we have something called the one-to-one -one dependency, which just means like each output partition depends on like the corresponding input one. Um, and the compute function is you're given an iterator for the parent, just look at the items in there and return only the ones that pass the filter. So all this, these functions deal with, uh, with iterators. And finally, in this one, we don't override preferred locations or partitioner. One of the things with preferred location is the scheduler will automatically look at the parent if, if you don't have preferred locations. So that's kind of how we pass those um, through the graph. And only these dependencies are Yeah, exactly. If it's a shuffle, then actually there are no preferred locations. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and um, finally, the last one I'll show here is, um, say that you are doing a join, so in a join, you know, one, one way to do it would be uh, to create an RDD called join RDD. And um, partitions here, you set the number of reduce tasks before. So it's just one per task. Um, and you just configure it when you write your program. Dependencies, we have a special type called the shuffle dependencies, which, which tells the system to actually do a shuffle. Um, and then the compute function is now you get iterators for the shuffle data, and you just read the keys from each one and do a local join for the things that, uh, that were hashed to your partition. And one of the things in this one is it has no placement preferences because the reduce task, you can kind of place it anywhere. It has to talk on the network anyway. But we know that the output is going to be hash partitioned because we did a shuffle and that hashes the data. So we actually um, use this. And what's nice about this is that uh, later on, if we do other operations on this, Spark can sometimes avoid reshuffling the data because it knows it's already shuffled and hashed together. So it, that can come in sometimes. Okay. Um, so, and let me just um, show maybe, um, I, I, um, yeah, actually, I guess, I'll, let me just show you these things in the code also, just so you can actually see some, uh, some code um, before we go back. To, I didn't want to show it on of it, but I think it's worth it. Um, so this, can you guys see this, or is this too small? You want it bigger? Okay. Let's see um, how much bigger we can make it. Is this any better, or is it still too small? Let me just make it a bit bigger. Oh, it is means? Yeah. I think it's okay. I think this will be enough. Um, okay, so, so this is kind of this is the actual like RDD class in the Spark code. It has a comment on it, you know, that explains essentially the stuff I was listing before. So for what what the API is, but this is what the methods look like. So it's an abstract class. You have the set of partitions which are called splits, and it's an array of like any kind of object that extends split. Um, you have a function to compute a split. And you're given this task context, which is like other stuff that's going on in executing this task. And basically, the compute function is given the split, give me back an iterator of t. t is the type of elements in this data set. Um, you have dependencies, which are these dependency objects. Um, and these are like the three things you have to implement. And optionally, if you want, you can implement uh, partitioner and preferred locations. So uh, partitioner is just give me this partitioner object. And preferred locations is give me a list of host names, or if you give me the empty list, I'll assume you have no preferences. So that's kind of how these things work. And basically, all, all the rest of the things, like for example, let's look at filter. 
and this is later on in the file, if you call rdd.filter, what that's gonna do is you give it a function on the rdd, it's going to return a new filtered rdd and um, uh, given that function. The clean stuff is to actually make the function something we can ship across the network. Um, but basically all the operations in RDD, when you call them, they, they build a new uh, guy of a different subclass, like here filtered RDD. So if you stay on the line for compute? For compute, yeah. So, so the idea is that you can operate, or we could operate on one object at a time. It's a pull model. Yeah, it is. It's a pull model, yeah. And many of them do that, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so let's look at just two of the subclasses. So. Hadoop RDD is the one I talked about before um, that's reading from Hadoop. And basically it has its own Hadoop split which extends um, Spark's split class. And it stores something which is called an input split in Hadoop. Hadoop has its own concept of input formats and like ways to partition the data. Uh, so we just use that directly. If, if you're not familiar with Hadoop, I guess this will, might seem kind of unusual. But essentially Hadoop has a concept of input split. Um, and basically, in Hadoop RDD, you know, there's a bunch of stuff, but essentially, we create our splits by creating a Hadoop input format object and asking it what are its splits. And then in our compute function, um, we, um, you know, we have to cast it and do some random stuff, but basically, we end up creating this record reader object from the Hadoop input format class. So the, the point here is that Hadoop has this input library um, called input format and record reader for reading from systems. So any storage system that Hadoop supports, like HDFS or HBase, you can get a record reader from it. And we just call it, and we return an iterator of, in this case, the key value pairs, because that's what uh, Hadoop data contains. It's always key value pairs. And you know this is kind of the iterator we return. Um, and finally, preferred locations, um, basically, Hadoop actually tells us the preferred locations for the split as part of its input format operation, and um, essentially we, we just pass that on to Spark. So that's all it is. So like this whole file that deals with the Hadoop RDD is, I guess, is like 121 lines. Um, and you know maybe you don't want to understand what all the lines are, but it's it's kind of neat because it means like to plug in your own input format, you just need to have that compute method essentially, and maybe preferred locations and then it will work and you can do all the operations on it that Spark supports and like everything will, uh, will, will compose together nicely. And hey, so these guys are resistant to this? The, uh, the Hadoop ones? Well, I, yeah. Well, I the, wonder why these, the RDD, the, there's a transient? Oh, the, yeah, yeah. So the reason for the transient, yeah, it's a good question. It's because whenever we ship a task, we actually ship the RDD objects too and uh, then we call compute on them. Because that's like how the code is set up. So some of the things, they don't actually want to ship along. Like the Spark context, it doesn't make sense to ship that to another machine. Um, this is, yeah, one of the bits that's a little confusing now. But it's basically the way we ship tasks is by sending a Scala closure object, which is essentially like a Java object with pointers to all of these guys. Yeah. OK. So that's, you know, if you, that's a, like, a, I guess, looking at the code to see what's in there. Um, so these other guys work in similar ways. Talked about this one. Um, so let me let me go um, into a little more detail on these dependency types also. Um, so basically, the I guess the, the most interesting part of the interface is the dependencies. And there are two types of dependencies that we know about. Um, one is these, what we call narrow dependencies. It's kind of like the one-to-one -one I talked before, which are essentially things that can be pipelined. I think that the actual definition of it is that each input data partition goes to only one uh, one child partition. So that's that's what it is. So that means we can actually pipeline it with computing the child partition. And there are, there are many operations that create these. The map and filter have this one-to-one -one pattern above. But you can also have stuff like union. In union, we just say, like, if you union two guys with two partitions, you get a guy with four partitions, and, like, two are from one parent and two are from the other, so it fits nicely in the model. The other thing is, if you join two data sets that I say both hash partitioned, then we know that we can do the join locally because they're, they're partitioned in the same way. There's no need to actually shuffle stuff around. So that ends up with a narrow dependency as well, where like we take, you know, uh, these are both hash, so like partition three here and partition three here get, uh, get joined together. 
Um, and then the next thing, we, what we call white dependencies, are when you have to do a shuffle, essentially, when it's an all-to-all, -all where like each um, output depends on essentially all of the input partitions. And then we actually have to have a stage boundary and do a shuffle. So if you actually look at the code, um, maybe I'm not going to have a ton of detail about this, but uh, the, the actual DAG scheduler object um, has this nice interface to the outside world that all the actions used to run, and then it looks at these dependencies and these objects to actually do stuff. Um, so basically, the interface to this is this method called run job, and essentially, you, you just give it an RDD that you want to run a job on, like the one that you're doing a count. You give it a function to run on each partition, and you give it an object to listen for the results, and basically, each time one of the tasks completes and you get a result back, that listener function will be called. Um, and its job, as we talked about before, is to build these stages. Um, the, it builds these task objects that have some code and some locations, submit them, and then we submit failed stages um, if they're lost. So just to show what that interface looks like, if we go back to here, um, let's see. Oops. So for example, when we do count, count is one of these actions. And um, we're going to call this a hunt job method, which calls, ultimately, it calls like the DAG scheduler that hunt job. So we're back in RDD.scala. And if, when you do a count, basically, you say run a job on this RDD. Here's the function to run on each partition. This function just like counts up the, the elements in, in the iterator like, of the partition um, uh, into a long, because the number might be bigger than like 2 billion. So you turn it as a long. And then uh, run job is going to return these things as an array by default, unless you add like a custom listener that merges them as they come in one by one. And then we do a sum at the end. And this run job in here ends up doing, uh, this is spark context that run job. And you know, there's a bunch of chains. But eventually, it calls dag scheduler that run job. Um, and you, you give that guy, um, basically, that guy is the one that receives a, a, an iterator and, and runs this stuff. And this also brings all the nice stuff out for you in terms of time. And that's kind of how that works. OK. Um, so yeah, so the, that's the DAG scheduler. So the scheduler performs a bunch of optimizations. Also, um, I think I talked about the pipelining. So when you have stuff like this down here, where you did all these narrow transformations, it's going to automatically group those into tasks. So in this case, for example, um, it's going to group all these guys into just one task, uh, even though there's like a map and a union going on in there. Um, so it just does that for you. Um, it, it picks the join algorithms. Um, so when you do a join like here, we're joining one thing that is split, in, is hashed, you know, kind of mod four into four partitions, and then one thing that's hashed into three partitions. And since the output has only three partitions, we know we can reuse those guys directly. We don't need to like reshuffle them. And so we get a narrow dependency on that guy and a shuffle dependency on the bottom guy. Um, and actually, in this case, the scheduler will even place these tasks on the same machines that those guys are uh, cached in memory on, uh, because it, it just wants to optimize the placement. So um, yeah? Talk a little bit about how it knows or how it determines these two connections. Oh, it just knows. Um, the, basically, as the workers compute stuff, if the, if the data set was marked to be cached, they'll tell the master, they'll say, hey, now I have partition five of like this data set in, in memory. Um, and so it will know, it, each time it schedules a job, it looks at that and it asks which ones are already available. Yeah. And how does it know those partitions are still available? Hmm. Uh, they also tell them when they drop them. And yeah. also the master knows? Yeah. But, but this... Here? Yeah, it, it tells the master when they drop them. But I guess an important thing is this is, um, the placement is only a hint, so I'll talk about that. But the task objects are designed to run on any node. And if you put them on the node where the thing is cached, they'll read it from the cache. Otherwise, they'll go back and recompute it, or whatever it takes to, to get that back. So it's, it's OK if, if we don't hear that a thing was lost until like after we sent the task to it. Yeah, but my yeah. question is slightly more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. The cache might be computed from a RDD um, set of ancestors. Yeah. Whose input might have original, whose original input might have changed. Like oh, yeah. Like HDFS 
Yeah, okay, so we don't support the HDFS input changing underneath you. We don't support that. Don't support as in you don't take that into account? No, yeah, we don't take it into account, yeah. Yeah. So that's there's no invalidation. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't aim to do that. I think that's a thing you can do it um, kind of at the application level above if you want, but we, we don't aim to support that right now, yeah. Yeah. So all these data sets are immutable once what's created. Yeah. Uh huh. So how is the life cycle of the cache data related to the life cycle of the actual task which produced it? Um, so the, the cache data stays in there um, until enough other cache data is created that it will be evicted. So there's like this least recently used policy on the node. So, so the, yeah. The task can actually exit, but something else is maintaining that cache output. Yeah, yeah. The cache, so the workers are persistent, I should say. The, all the tasks run in like the same JVM on each machine, and that JVM stays around between tasks. And so it's just sitting in there in an array. Yeah, it's, it's not, like in Hadoop, each, each task has its own JVM. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's that's what this guy does. Um, let's see. Okay. So next thing, so the task details. So um, what do the task objects look like? So as I said, kind of the way tasks begin is only, um, only at shuffle boundaries or like at the very in beginning of your job where there's no input. Um, so essentially, all the tasks kind of look like this. So each task um, um, has, as its input, it has either external data from out, like from HDFS, or it needs to fetch map outputs from a previous stage. And then it runs, it might run multiple functions that are chained together into these iterators, that just happens. Um, and then there's two kind of things that can come up with at the end. One is like a result that sends back to the master, like in that count, we send back an integer, uh, or uh, it can create a, an output file that someone else in a later stage will fetch. So from the point of view of like the worker running these tasks, that's all that happens. And it just gets this thing and, and runs it and sees what happens. Um, the, as I mentioned, like basically the reason, the reason we, we save the output instead of piping them directly to the next stage, well, there's a few reasons. One is simplicity, but the other reason is to allow you to retry. Like if the reduce task fails and you have pushed stuff to it, you know, um, at least we have a copy locally that we can push to another, um, uh, another instance of the reduce task. So every intermediate result is always present on the disk? It's not always on disk. It will go in, in memory first and then fall on disk. But yeah, yeah. And actually, we're looking at ways to like clean it up even before it comes to this kind of stuff in the future. Yeah. Okay. How does so garbage collection? Gar yes. Yeah. So garbage collection. So in terms of the the cache itself, we we do this least recently used thing, and essentially we estimate the sizes of the objects, and like you you tell us how much memory to keep, and we'll get rid of them when we think we have too much. Um, the, there's a few different implementations. Like one is, um, so if we keep just Java objects in the cache, then you know we, we kind of have to guess what their size is, but we have uh, uh, some code that does that, that actually gets it right a lot of the time. It, you can also keep data um, serialized in the cache, and then it's just an array of bytes, and like, we just have a big you know, amount of memory. Yeah. So what is the recommended maximum size of RAM per remote? Oh, you, you can configure it. You can say, this is how much RAM I want to use for caching on this node. It can be different on each node. And you have some algorithms to say the GC is not taking too much time on that? Uh, we, we don't do that automatically now. I think we have some tuning uh, guidelines. Like if you make it, basically if you make it so um, this stuff fits in like the old generation of the Java heap, then it will be okay. Uh, if it spills into the new one, you'll get a lot of GCs. But yeah, there's, there's a bit of tuning you can do, yeah. And in the future, we, we might use like off-heap memory and stuff like that too, but we don't have it right now. Yeah. Can you specify the memory footprint at the RDB level? Uh, not right now. That would be a cool thing to, to add, but not right now. So it's just global now. Yeah. So do the map outputs, do you see map outputs stacking the input or Uh, Actually, I guess they could. Um, I haven't really seen that happen, but I guess they, it could happen that map outputs evict other stuff. Yeah, I think in the future we want to have like uh, priority levels and maybe a pluggable policy for this, but that's kind of what it is now. Yeah, but th this is actually, this is one of the things I was gonna talk about in like what we can do next. Okay. So what's the memory solution for the map output? It's actually bytes. Those we always serialize because 
they're going to be shipped on the network. So it's just an array of bytes. Yeah. Okay. So that's how this works. Um, and then I think the final thing I want to say about this is that the task object is designed to be self-contained. So even if you're working on cache data, it, it includes the functions that, that built you all the way from the input, which is like either a shuffle boundary or the Hadoop file. And what that means is we can send the task to a node that doesn't have the data cached, or you know, even if um, uh, all copies of the data have been lost, the task will still be able to run, but it will just end up recomputing some stuff. Um, and that was a design goal that I kind of had from the beginning to simplify the scheduling later. I wanted any task to be able to run on any node. And in fact, even if you have two copies of it to deal with stragglers and stuff, it just makes it a lot easier. Um, so essentially, the only way a task can fail, other than like your own code being buggy and crashing it, is if we lost the map output files from the previous stage. And then we give up on it and we tell the DAX scheduler, you know, go submit on any stage. How, how many tasks do you run? How many in parallel? As many as there are cores in your, I, I mean, you can configure, but usually one per CPU core in your cluster. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So that's kind of what this is. Um, and um, I, think, I think I've probably shown enough about this. Um, let me just see what else I have. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably skip some of this stuff. OK. So let me just go to this one. Um, so I just had a bit more on the task scheduler, and I had like the exact events that go back and forth between it and the DAX scheduler, but I'm just going to skip that. Um, so finally, the tasks get to the worker, and the worker is a, essentially is this very simple class called executor in the code, and it just receives these objects and it calls on on them, and the object shifts together when it was serialized. It shipped all the objects that depended on all the functions to compute it and stuff. So it just runs them in a thread pool. Um, and it sends the results back to the master. What, one of the reasons I wanted to put it is like, um, the, both this and the task scheduler are pluggable. So you can plug in your own uh, implementation to run it on a new resource manager. Like say you wanted to run on something other than Mesos and the standalone mode. You can plug that in. Um, other things you'll see in the code uh, are the block manager. Um, not going to go into too much detail, but basically this is kind of a key value story that's essentially read-only. Once you add a value, you can't modify it. And it, it deals with serving blocks between machines. Um, communication manager does this networking and shuffle that I talked about before. And it has some asynchronous I.O. code. Um, and then there's a thing called the map output tracker, which um, tells the reduce task where to fetch map task outputs from. Uh, and each, each, um, each worker actually caches the map locations, and uh, this thing deals with invalidating them as well. So these are kind of the bits here. Um, so I just have a couple of smaller things next, um, and then I think um, I'll be done. Um, so next thing is just like, how can you extend this? Uh, so there are, there are a few places where you can extend stuff already. And there are places where it wouldn't be hard to plug something in, but we don't have an API for it yet. So if you want to suggest an API, like say for cache eviction, that would be a nice uh, addition to have. But the most common thing people have done is just subclassing RDB itself to create new operators or new input sources. So as an example, uh, we had, say, a DynamoDB input source that was written as a subclass of RDB. Uh, subclassing this scheduler backend, it's this interface for the task scheduler, allows you to run on new types of cluster managers. It can also be useful. And also, you can implement your own serialization, and that, that can be an optimization as well. Um, some of the things we'd like to have in the future is a pluggable, like, inter-job scheduler. Right now, it's just first in, first out. So that would be nice to have. Uh, pluggable cache eviction, and also a lot of people have asked for instrumentation. Like, I want to be told how much memory my job is using, uh, or whether tasks are failing, or stuff like that, because I want to run this automatically behind something. So there are no interfaces for these now, but if someone really wants to add one, um, you know, I, I'd be glad to, to accept an interface for that, because these are things that it would be nice to have. Um, if you want um, to put this stuff to use, um, it's actually like really uh, uh, pretty straightforward, I would say, to write your own RDD that does either a new transformation or a new input source. 
So for example, if you look at the Hadoop one and say you write one that reads from the local file system, it's a nice kind of exercise to learn about the code. If you want to add a new transformation, implement your own filter or map uh, or a new action. Um, if this is, I think, this is like how I do, recommend actually like learning the internals if you want to get to this level of like scheduling stuff. Um, so these are some things you can try out. And finally, um, just want to end um, with a slide on how to contribute. Uh, so we, uh, we're really glad to accept external contributions. We sh we've actually gotten some really substantial ones already uh, uh, for Spark and for Shark as well. Um, so we're, we're very excited about that. Um, and if you want to do it, there's a few things to look at. Issue tracking, we've moved that now to Jira. We have a hosted Jira from the company that makes Jira. So post your issues there. Um, development discussion, we have a mailing list. And finally, the, the code itself is in the master branch on GitHub. And the preferred way to send patches is through a pull request. And then we can code review it and stuff um, as part of that. Um, if you do that, make sure that it passes the code style and make sure that it actually adds tests. Um, we have a bit of guidelines on the website to do that as well. So, so that's, that's kind of it. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. I'd be glad to take uh, any more questions. Yeah. Do you have support for Avro? support for Avo. We only have it through the Hadoop input format for Avo. So you can call, there's this method like Hadoop, um, called Hadoop RDD that lets you create one from an arbitrary input format. Uh, it would be, again, if you want to add a nicer one, like for sequence file, we have some nicer interfaces on top. Uh, it's not too hard to add that. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk some more about the test infrastructure? The test infrastructure, yeah. So apart from the uh, the sort of unit tests that we have, uh, like some of which are just in one process, some of which are actually multi-process and try to emulate like machines failing and stuff. Um, we also have this test suite that we can run on EC2 that runs a bunch of mostly performance tests now. Uh, and that's what we've been using as we make releases to make sure that everything still runs okay. That's in a different GitHub project. Um, I actually forget the exact name, but I can give you a pointer to that. Um, and in the future, we're hoping to um, do something like run that every week or something like that to actually have that in-house. Yeah. So how does the task does uh, chaining of operators? Oh, the way the task does chaining is actually, I should go back, it's, it's inside this RDD uh, class. Um, basically, the, all the methods in RDD, like let's see, so compute takes as input Compute returns an iterator, and most of the time it takes in an iterator as well. So for example, um, if we look at filtered, did I show this? I think I showed this one before. Um, so filtered RDD, uh, basically its compute on a split is call iterator on the parent and take its iterator and then uh, filter it. So this so is actually the RDD itself, right? How does that, like, what is how, how do they get into the task object? Yeah, then the task itself merge. Kind of yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Well, the task is going to have, like, say we did a filter and then a map or something. The task is going to take the map guy and it's going to call Dump compute on it. And then the computer is going to recursively call the parent. So the, the task actually takes all the Java objects here. The, they get serialized using Java serialization. So because filtered RDD has a pointer to its parent, we also get its parent. And then when we call compute on like the output guy, it will it will ask its parent uh, to compute stuff. So essentially, the task I can show you like th there's two types of tests. There's like um, let's say let's look at this one. So resolve task is a task that returns an attempt back to the that that returns a result back to the master instead of writing map output files. And all it does is it calls you know, it has an RDD it needs to run on, it has a split, and it calls rdd.iterator on the split. And the RDD objects automatically like capture that chain. So it's just some recursive stuff. Yeah. Should also say there's a difference. Iterator is different from compute. So basically, compute is build it for me, uh, you know, like actually do the computation. Iterator is if you have it cached, give me the one from the cache. So like clients always call iterator, but implementers always implement compute. But that's how it works. It's just Java objects. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Or yeah. How do you do workflow like uh, Mozi? Workflows. Yeah. Right now we don't have anything special for that. Now inside 
a Spark job, you can actually have fairly complex workflows if, you, if you'd like, just because you have these general graphs. Outside, I think you could use Uzi to call this, but I haven't, I haven't actually looked at that. Yeah? Uh, can you talk about which parts are performance sensitive? Where, where the, the hot Ooh, yeah. Which parts are performance sensitive? Um, there's a few things. So I think the shuffle is one of the most performance sensitive things. Uh, actually, we, we spent a lot of time tuning the shuffle recently, um, and we, we ended up doing this thing where like, you, when you're a reduced task and you're trying to fetch map outputs, you fetch from a few machines in parallel uh, using asynchronous I.O. And you also, you actually receive an estimate of their sizes in advance, so you can fetch multiple blocks if the blocks are really small. And you try to, to group these together to keep like, the TCP uh, 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 sockets full. Um, that's one of the things. And this, the sort, I should say, is also um, something that's, that's actually gotten faster than we, we thought it would be. So like in, in the latest benchmarks we did with Hive and stuff like that against Shark, we, we end up really outperforming Hive in, in uh, shuffle intensive operations. But it's, it's one thing that can be improved more. Um, other things that are intensive but that are harder to deal with are um, all these chaining of iterators. So actually, if you do many like simple things chained together, the function call overhead from iterators can add a lot. And we have some plans to like uh, inline those to avoid calling that. But that's, uh, it's, it's harder to do. But I think if you look at it, that can be a CPU bottleneck, all these iterators together. Any numbers on that? Any numbers? Yeah, I think. Uh, in some tests I did, like uh, just using this functional style of iterators could be like three times slower than writing a while loop in Java. So it, it depends what you're doing, but it's it's I think I would like to fix it. it. You know, it's not the highest priority. Now what we've done in some of the operations we do, like the count you saw, I had actually like unhold the loop under. I had a while true, and I um, uh, I added one to an integer instead of using. Uh, closure. So in some cases, we've unhold the loop. In join as well, and in, in group by, uh, we've tried to unhold as many of the functional loops as possible and, and to actually um, do it quickly. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of monitoring do you have for uh, given spot the problem? What kind of monitoring? So the, the, the clusters you run on, either the standalone mode or the Spark, um, uh, or sorry, or the Mesos one, uh, will tell you about the tasks that are currently running and whether they failed and things like that. And the tasks themselves have logging. The other thing we have is messages back to the master. So the master is told about most types of problems that happen. Uh, but I think the biggest thing ma missing is an API. So if you wanted to plug in your own, I think that it would be cool to have that. We don't have that yet. HBase. Um, HBase, yeah. yeah. How much is the performance part of it? Compared to HBase? Yes. You mean compared to reading from HBase? Yes. Um, so in our tests, so I, I actually haven't done a test with reading from HBase, but even um, compared to like reading bytes from, uh, from the Linux file system, like not even HDFS, just Linux file system, um, operating on, on Java objects that are in the same JVM can be a lot faster. I like can be two or three times faster. Because just uh, d depending on your format, marshalling and serializing the bytes can actually add a lot of overhead. So, um, so it, when possible, it's good to keep data in Spark's own cache instead of keeping it in something like HBase. But we can read from HBase instead if you have data there. Yeah. I, think, um, I don't think you mentioned this, but can you show us code and explain how you would avoid serialization if a stage runs multiple tasks in a single window? How you avoid serialization? Oh, it's okay. So yeah, again, it's it's not. You mean if if uh, you mean serialization of the task or just tasks that read from each other? Yeah. So in that case, we don't actually avoid it. If if you um, if the tasks happen to only to read from each other and be on the same node, but if the tasks are pipelined, if the operations are pipelined into a single task, like in the um, examples I showed, you know, like these guys then there's no serialization because it's just those iterators are calling each other. Like the way it's set up, the, the, the guy who consumes the iterator doesn't know whether you're reading that over the network or you're actually computing it right there. It just gets an iterator. So these things, in, the, in here there's no serialization of these guys. At the boundary there is. Yeah. And also if you're unlucky and like you hand this guy on a different node from that guy, then that stuff has to be transferred, but that's how it is. And even from cache, sorry, reading from cache will also uh, avoid. Yeah, reading from cache. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Okay. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah. For uh, application developers, uh -huh. when would you not recommend implementing a task as a long pipeline? Um, I think, <coughs> honestly, like, I, I want to encourage people to implement it in the way that's um, easiest for them to express. So I want the overhead of having a long pipeline to be as small as possible. I think if you notice, um, if you do some profiling and you see a lot of performance uh, uh, overhead from that, then you might want to pipeline them yourself. But otherwise, I think it's, it's encouraged to do it, yeah. Like I certainly, I don't want people to worry about these overheads too much. And they're like, they're very small compared to like other things that could be expensive, like just sending stuff over the network or heating it from disk. So yeah, yeah. How's the uh, how's the production? Uh, in how many people use it for production? How many people use it for production? I would say, uh, let's see. I think I know like at least four companies now that are using it in production. Um, yeah, it depends what what you count as production, but certainly like some that have the product based on it, like user facing product ends up talking to Spark on the back end. Others that use it for their analytics for like reports they'll send to their customers or whatever. So that's that's what I'd say. Uh, yeah. On your website you have Opinas and Fullscore, I think. Yeah, so Conviva Quant and Quantifind are the two that I've talked about the most. There are actually other startups as well that are using it, but that haven't really talked about it. Yeah. How does Spark streaming fit into this? Software? Yeah, how does Spark streaming, okay, so I, I knew someone would ask about it eventually. So, so the way Spark streaming works is it just periodically submits new jobs to the scheduler and it keeps the data um, cached in, uh, in, in memory using the caching mechanism on the nodes in between. Um, and basically it adds the syntactic sugar to make that nicer looking than you writing a loop. So Spark streaming reuses all this stuff. Um, actually the code in, in the master branch is essentially all, is like most of the changes we had made for Spark streaming um, yeah. when, when we initially prototyped it. So that code is already in the public branch. Uh, and we plan to, to actually uh, put out um, a branch with the streaming code really soon. I don't know exactly how soon, maybe you no, can no, see. Okay, a couple of weeks, ago. okay. So yeah, so that's, that's the plan. But yeah, I, actually we, we want it to be a major uh, feature in the next release, yeah. Yeah. They, they, they were saying that you could query like a window, like an hour, 10 yes, minutes yes. For, for, for streaming. Yeah, so for streaming, it will, it will automatically kind of figure out which data sets fall into that window and, and do the query for you. And it will also, as the window moves forward, it will like subtract old stuff and add new stuff, try to come up with an efficient way to compute it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. How about the new stuff? Oh yeah, the approximate. So yeah, I didn't talk about it. Yeah, one of the uh, interesting things with the interface to the scheduler is like you can because you put this result listener, you can actually return a result before all the tasks in a stage have finished. So like one of the things we did is um, give me a count of this data set, but make it approximate. Like if, if the tasks don't finish in time because there's a straggler, just give me an approximate value. And you can actually find that in the code. I haven't really documented it because it's, uh, it's kind of an Easter egg right now. Like it may not be the final feature, but, uh, but for example, this is count the box is like you give it a timeout and it gives you a confidence interval if it can't compute the thing. Uh, we're looking to use these in systems like streaming or like uh, Shark to actually um, uh, support approximate results if you have a deadline. Like in Shark, you might say, you know, sample the data set and just give me the best answer you can in five seconds. Um, so we might actually use that, but it's still, it's kind of an early on thing. There is, yeah. It returns this this thing, which you can add a listener on this guy to get the final result. But this is kind of, this is kind of a hidden feature right now. It's not <laughs> it's not really meant to be used. Um, although it would be cool if you have a use case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think I saw just a little bit of web. Uh, like yeah. Web. Page to be page yeah. Page page or two. But what uh, presumably for monitoring? What can you talk about? What um, you know? What what your where do you see that going? Where, where, yeah, where so there are two things, yeah. So right now there's a web interface in the standalone scheduler, which includes just which nodes are up in the cluster, which tasks they're doing, and like give me access to their log. In the future, we want every Spark job to have its own monitoring interface, where you can see which data sets are in memory, 
how much RAM they're using, which tasks are running, maybe even some profiling info. Um, and we're probably going to have a first version of that in the next release as well. Like there's actually, well, there's a pull request for it right now. I guess it will be March soon enough. Yeah. And when's the next release? Uh, we're hoping to do something in January. Oh, it's the same. Yeah, in January too. Yeah. Do you guys have a plan for Java client? We have a Java API now. Yeah. And actually, I didn't talk about that, but it's it's there. And it's, uh, it has all the operations you can do in this. We're, we're also working on a Python one. You can find like a branch on GitHub, but it's not actually um, finished yet. Yeah? So what's the story on using more than one Spark context? Yeah, right now, using more than one Spark context will cause some problems because there are some um, system properties, like which port am I using, that uh, they will both clash on. Um, in the future, I want to allow using more than one Spark context. Because we, so if you use only one at a time, like you create one and then you shut it down, it's okay. That's what our tests do actually. All the tests are in the same JVM. But it, I want to allow more later. Yeah. But do you want to, I mean, right now because the information about the context doesn't make it the types at all, it's actually possible to compile like a joint. Oh yeah. RDDs yeah, and that would, that would be bad, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I can do about that. I mean, maybe there's some. Is there ever any intention to make that possible or? I don't know. I, I think that's, that would be like a lower priority thing. I think, um, like one thing we will do, it, I should say, is um, uh, there's a system um, uh, that, that's being worked on to share RDDs across instances of Spark. So that, that will be there. But, but uh, yeah, in terms of one program making two of them, I don't know how I can easily do that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a question that I mean, whether it's worthwhile starting, trying to do work to improve the type of safety. Yeah, yeah. Possible yeah. Yeah, we should at least add a check for it. I think instead of failing in some really miserable way, we can probably add a runtime check. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's an interesting thought. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, Scala 2.10? Are you? Oh yeah, Scala 2.10. I haven't looked at it. I think um, I think someone on the list had looked at it and like, had some issues with SBT. So probably once it comes out, um, we'll spend some time on it. I'm not positive how much change it, it takes. So I've been hoping to finish other stuff before. Is there, yeah. is there stuff in the, you're using the Scala interpreter? Yeah, that's the scariest part, yeah. Because we, we kind of had to uh, copy in a lot of the interpreter codes that's private just to modify a few things. So that's the scariest part. Other than that, I think we'll be OK. Are there things there that don't work as well as you would like? That you in the interpreter? Yeah. Yeah, it would be nice if the Scala guys made it so you can plug stuff into the interpreter. I actually talked with them about it, so eventually they might. Because um, the changes you make are not huge, but, um, but they're enough that we have to actually like, kind of fork the code for that. So, and it's annoying to port it to each new version. And each version, there's like some crazy Scala hacker who refactors the whole interpreter and <laughs> makes it much cleaner, I'm sure, but it's, it's, it makes it harder for us to do this. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess one, one other thing I'm curious about is like, um, do people have things they would want to see in, in future developer meetups? So like, <coughs> things they're curious about was this kind of what people expected. Uh, one of the meetups they're going to do next will be on Shark. I think that's really obvious. And then we might have an in-depth one on, on streaming as well. But I'm curious what people want to know. If, if you can tell me now or you can send an email later, I'm just curious. Uh, about uh, real-time applications using machine learning algorithms. Ah, that's, you'd like to see like an example application. Okay, that's a good idea, yeah. That's, uh, I think we should do that. I think we actually have some people who developed those um, in, in Berkeley, and we should get someone to talk about it, yeah. Uh, many places want to use Spark, uh, <coughs> probably already have some uh, uh, distributed computing platform. Yeah. It would be nice to see or present how they can coexist. I see, yeah. Good, to good gradually point. deploy. Right, good point, yeah. Okay, so like how, yeah, yeah, maybe cool to get someone to talk about that, like someone who's actually done it. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, thanks for coming. I guess let me know afterwards if you have any other questions.